uh, having an active transplant. Now, the commitment that's going to require is slightly different from your other placements, and I'll explain why. But the rest of you may want to see children in Grand Union, uh, and we do admit children there after they have had the transplant to treat the different complications. And I think you will understand better their needs if you know what the transplant is like beforehand. Okay, so let me start. So we're slightly different from the rest of the transplant units in the UK. We just do transplantation for disorders in which children either have abnormal hemoglobins, like sickle cell disease or thalassemia, or cannot make blood like a plastic anemia or any of the inherited uh, conditions where poor marrow fails, like Falconi anemia or Dermatan anemia or so on. And we are one of the large units of the country that we don't do any leukemia. That's what makes us different. Now, although everybody gets very excited about things like leukemia, in fact, these conditions have an awful prognosis. So if you take, for example, sickle cell disease, this is the average survival of people with sickle cell disease. So by 45 years of age, half of them are dead. And I know for you, that's probably, you know, by 45 years of age, all of us will be put to death anyway. But when you reach my age, you realize that that's a very short life. In fact, it's not just the fact that they have a very short life in comparison with the general population, and here you have the general population, is that very early on in life have very serious complications. So, you know, even by two or three years of age, uh, they will have had painful crises. So these are admission to hospital where the pain is so severe that they have to be given infusions of morphine. Uh, by five years of age, you can see that 40% of them will have had uh, dactylitis, so this is swelling of the hands and legs. By 10 years of age, two-thirds of them will have had what is called an acute chest syndrome. It means they lack the blood supply into the lungs. Very serious complication where often they have to finish in intensive care and they have to have their whole blood be exchanged for normal blood and it has a 10% risk of death. And 15% of the children will have had a stroke by the age of 15. Uh, you know, there is no other reason almost to have a stroke in childhood other than to have sickle cell disease. So although, you know, the name of sickle cell disease or thalassemia bomarophelia may not sound as exciting as leukemia, these are children who have very poor, uh, you know, outcomes in life and hence why we offer them transplantation. So as you, most of you will know, but I know some of you are uh, in the first year and some of you are not medical graduates, so I'm going to show you this. So, you know, all our blood is produced inside of the bones, inside of the big bones, uh, mainly of the hip, but also the sternum and the vertebra, and from there we get the white cells, the red cells, and the platelets. And this is why what the bone marrow ought to look like, full of cells. And of course, if you have a bone marrow failure syndrome, then that is empty. And the good thing about doing transplantation of bone marrow is that not only we are transplanting the stem cells, which are going to give rise to all the hemopoietic cells, whether red cells, uh, you know, platelets or white cells, we are also transplanting the same stem cell which is going to give us the immune system. We are transplanting the T cells and the B cells. So that means that we are transplanting the same immune system that matches the organ we are transplanting. And eventually, something like six months after the transplant, we are going to be able to remove all the medication from these children and they are going to be truly cured from the condition. So this is not like a kidney transplant or a liver transplant where people receive the organ from the donor, but then they have to remain on drugs to suppress the immune system and avoid a rejection for the rest of their life. Because we transplant both the organ, the blood system, and the immune system, eventually we'll be able to finish the medication and have a true cure. So if you are able to help us uh, and support these children, you will be part of a really nice story. Okay, so what do we do in transplantation? We need to eradicate the disease, we need to avoid the rejection of the bone marrow, and then we need to avoid the body being attacked by the immune system that derives uh, from the bone marrow that we have transplanted. And that is called graft disease. And this is one of the words that you hear if you look after these patients. So how do we achieve that? We uh, match the patients to the donors. We use chemotherapy to eradicate the original disease, what we call myeloblation, and we use immunosuppression both to avoid the new bone marrow being rejected and also to avoid the new bone marrow uh, rejecting the body or attacking the body, graft disease. So the patients receive chemotherapy, then they get the new bone marrow, 
they don't have an operation, the person who gets the operation is the donor, the new bone marrow is given to them as if it were a blood transfusion that holds onto the inside of the bones and then around three to six weeks later produces mature blood. There's a window of time where the old bone marrow has been taken away and the new production has not established itself. And that's the reason why these patients are in isolation. They are in rooms where there's a special uh, filtration system to remove all small particles, including viruses. There's an anteroom uh, and they have an ensuite bathroom inside. And they cannot come out of that room for a minimum of five weeks or so. So, just to give you an, an idea, we tell the families that only three members of the family can look after that child during the transplant to avoid the transmission of infections. So if we say that to the families, because it's a real risk, then we cannot have a different volunteer coming every night. So, for the active part of the transplant, and if this is something that you will be excited about, then what we probably will ask you is that you commit yourself for a patient for four or five weeks to come maybe two or three times during that week. So it is a higher commitment than what you would normally do at the moment, but for a shorter period of time. And maybe that is something that you can fit in between at times when you don't have to write essays or do exams or do things like that. The other thing that we need to think about is that because of the, the children have received very high dose of chemotherapy, far higher than what you would use for any other form of, of oncology or any other treatment, they get very sick, they particularly develop a lot of pain in their mouth and in their stomach because they lose their lining and uh, they cannot be fed and they are on pumps of morphine and they feel very vulnerable and the last thing they want to do is to be meeting different people all the time. So they will benefit from some of you because they are going to be isolated for a very long period of time and they would love to have somebody to play with and be with, particularly you know, at times when they, they are no teachers and no specialists. But at the same time, they want to be attached to a particular person, otherwise they're going to feel very frightened. And possibly the first one or two sessions that you have with that patient, they will just get to know you and get the confidence. Now, there are three main complications that happen to them. They get very serious infections, normally with organisms that they don't do anything to the rest of us. And that is because the chemotherapy damages the tissues. So, you know, we all have lots of bugs in our throats and our guts that normally our mucosa protects from going into the bloodstream. If you take that line in a way, then the gram-negative bacteria uh, are going to pass onto the bloodstream. So that is why, why they get infections. They are also neutropenic, they don't have white cells to fight infections, and they are very immunosuppressed. And we, lots of us carry viruses in our body. You know, we all have herpes simplex viruses, we all have adenovirus in the gut, those, we have CMV in the bloodstream. Those viruses are kept at bay because we have a good immune system. If you take it away, they will reactivate and cause infections. And they can also have fungal infection in the chest. The second complication they might have is that despite of everything we do, a proportion of them can lose the graft, can lose the bone marrow that we have given them. And we detect that with a normal you know, DNA fingerprinting that the police use. We use it to follow the transplants. So sometimes we might pull the immune system to try to overcome that problem. Third serious complication is something called venoclusive disease. And what this means is that the blood supply of the liver particularly, but also the kidneys and on occasions the lungs, get damaged by the chemotherapy. And they get very swollen tummies with ascites, they get renal failure and liver failure. And this is one of the other things that can make them aware. And then the last one is what I spoke about before, is graft versus cause disease, which is when the new immune system attacks, you know, coming from the new bone marrow, perceives the body of that patient as being something different from, from the, the body from the patient where that bone marrow came from, the donor that came through, and attacks it. And that normally presents with very serious rashes. You can see here two pictures of our patients. It can present with difficulty in breathing, it affects the lungs. It can affect with severe vomiting and diarrhea. You know, these children, even though they're only two or three years of age, could be losing, you know, one to two liters of stools a day of the amount of diarrhea they get. Or, um, it can affect the liver, giving them jaundice. Now, despite all of that, and the problem is that when you are having a transplant, you see the most difficult part of the patient's life, eventually, they actually get very good results. And you can see here how... Sorry. This is the figures that we have up to 2010. Uh, we just analyzed the last year and it's very similar, it's 96%. We get cure rates of around 96%, 95, 96%. 
So it's worth helping them through this difficult time because you know that they're, they're going to be cured. They're going to be truly cured. So six months later, we will stop on medications. So this is what a transplant looks like. You have a period of time where we give them the start, they come a week before the actual transplant where we give them a combination of chemotherapy to eradicate the disease and prepare the bone marrow. Then we give them drugs to suppress the immune system like MMF and cyclosporin. And then on what we call day zero, we give them the new bone marrow and then we have to wait until uh, the blood grows again. And these are the figures of this year. You can see 25 patients, 96% pain rate. Now, it's very good to show you success rates from the medical point of view, but it's also very important that we look at the quality of life of these children. And this is one of the largest studies that has been done in children who have been transplanted for this condition. And you can see that before of the transplant, the quality of life is substantially lower than what we would expect for a child of that age. And that is 100, they only get somewhere around 80. At the time of the transplant, the quality of life drops significantly because they're unwell. And that is important for you to realize because you're going to go into a transplant cubicle where you're going to find a child who is unwell. And if you haven't seen children who are unwell before, that may be something that distresses you or shocks you. That's another thing that you have to think about it and pace yourself and be sure that you have talked to us and been introduced properly and that you have committee support. You know, at the time of a transplant, they are sick and we see that in the quality of life studies. But you look at them six months after finishing the transplant and look where they are almost in a hundred, you know, in the mid-90s, <coughs> having achieved a normal quality of life, and that's what we're trying to achieve. So our role, your role, is to try to support them during this period of time when things are tough, so that, you know, they get there without suffering as much as they would have suffered otherwise. Okay, so that was, what, that was the introduction I wanted to give you about the active transplant. If you feel that you can commit yourself to an intensive but maybe short period of time to help one of these children, that would be fantastic. If that's something that you cannot do but you want to help in the way that you help in Great Western and you want to see the children who get admitted in the post-transplant period with different complications, well that just gives you an overview of what that child will have gone through. Now I'm sure you are all very, very good, uh, and Nancy will talk to you more about this, about uh, being very careful with infection control measures, but with the transplant patients, and Gareth and so will tell you the same thing with infectious diseases patients, you have to be particularly <coughs> careful. So very important that you wear your hair up, that there is no jewelry, that you have nothing below the elbows, and that uh, you wash your hands and put an apron before you come into these rooms. The other thing that you have to be careful with is that, uh, uh, and I'm not implying anything, but the kind of patients that we transplant often come from ethnic minorities. We have a very large Muslim population. Some of the children come from abroad, uh, where uh, you know they come from countries where transplantation and these kind of treatments are not available to them, and we're able to offer them uh, this here. So it's important to be sensitive to cultural matters, to different religions, to different ways of doing things. So again, come appropriately dressed. Don't have plodding necklines or short trousers. Uh, and, and you know, always introduce yourself and, and uh, expect that some of the patients may not have English as a first language or even as a second language. And you might be able to interact with them uh, by playing, but not uh, you know, particularly by speaking in English. Okay, so do you want to ask me any qu quick questions now? Uh, how many of us are allowed to kind of say one treatment? So we do four transplants at any time, and uh, you know the idea would be to attach one student to each transplant, or maybe one student to two transplants, but in, you know, the idea you would only want to have one person going into that room. But that person will be well prepared, uh, you know, the Wednesday before you start the placement, we could offer you a couple of hours with Gemma, who is our lead BMT uh, player specialist, so that you feel confident in what you're doing and you are well supported. Anything else?
They also tell us comments whether you think this is you know something that you will be able to commit to or whether you think this is you know totally impossible. What we'll do then is people who are interested, we can make a note of your names afterwards or even over email. Um, so it is like, like Doris says, a, a greater commitment. But and even the slide that you showed about the sort of dip in quality of life, if we can be involved in that stage where they're at that, then for some of you who might be interested in that, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity, I think, to make an impact. Uh, you know, yeah. the, you know, that's, uh, that's right, and it, and it may be that you know, for your lifestyle, actually, it's something that fits very well with you. That, you know, you don't want to commit once every two weeks throughout the whole course, but you will be very willing to commit, you know, a little bit more intensely, but only for a month or for six weeks of, of your year. I don't know. Or maybe you really like it and you want to commit the whole year. <laughs> so, uh, Gareth, now where you are here, should we do Gemma first or do you want to go first? So Gemma is going to give you a few... Oh yes, yes, of course. Can you repeat the question? So the question is, if they want to commit to a child who's having a transplant, but there are only particular nights in the, in the week when you can do that, is that possible? Yes. I think what is important is that it's several times so that the child gets to know you, and both you and the child get something out of it, and it's important that it's consistent for, you know, at least for five weeks. Because there's no point of doing one week now and six weeks later another session because you have a different child. Uh, but which nights of the week or weekend uh, is suitable for you? Of course, that can be worked out perfectly uh, according to your to what you can do. 